and welcome to Gardening Australia. Now, many people living in inner city apartments head off to the local park for their green fix. But that's not the case for the residents of this block of flats. They've created their very own garden paradise up above the street, and they've asked me along to take a look. But before we get stuck in here, let's take a look at what else is on today's show. I'm in a playground that lets city children get back to nature by playing in it, on it, and through it. And I'll be giving my indoor plants some much needed TLC to keep them in top shape. Grafting your own plants at home can certainly seem like a bit of a daunting prospect. And as far as gardening skills go, it's at the advanced level. But the processes and techniques involved are actually really easy to follow. The results are very rewarding, and most of all, it's a lot of fun. Grafting gives the home gardener some huge advantages. Trees can be grafted onto dwarfing or semi-dwarfing rootstock, meaning normally large trees never get to their full size. You can also graft multiple varieties onto the one tree. And in the case of fruit trees, this means loads more different fruit for a longer harvest. Late winter and early spring, as the sap starts to rise and the buds start to swell, is the perfect time to get out there and start grafting. So let's go give it a crack. You're going to need two main plant materials to graft. You're going to need rootstock and your scions. Your rootstock are the base that your plant grows on. These are usually selected for their adaptability to soil type, disease resistance and vigour of growth. I've got an M9 dwarfing apple here. Now the scions are basically cuttings of the tree you want to graft onto the rootstock. These are selected for their quality of fruit. I've gone with the good old Coxus orange pippin. You'll also need a sharp budding knife, some budding tape, and a pair of secateurs. Matching your rootstock to your scion is critically important for successful grafting. Generally speaking, only plants of the same genus can be grafted onto each other. For example, oranges can be grafted onto lemons because they're both of the genus citrus. Another good tip is to make sure that your scion is about the same thickness as your rootstock. This will make your grafting easier and more successful. Now just a word on the cambium layer. This is the green living tissue found just under the bark. Now all grafting is, is trying to match up the green layer of your scion with the green layer of your rootstock. The more of this green tissue that you can match up together, the more successful your graft will be. The first grafting technique I want to show you is called whip and tongue. The advantage of this one is it forms a nice, neat, solid join. Also, there's plenty of surface area, which means that your graft should be more successful. Now, it's a little bit fiddly, but it's well worth the effort. Start by cutting your rootstock about 20 centimeters above the ground. Using a grafting knife, slice the rootstock stem to make a single wedge, then make a downward cut in the middle of the wedge to create a tongue. Take the scion and do exactly the same thing. It's these two tongues that now slot neatly into one another. You can see how they hold onto each other snugly. That's the end result you're after. Using grafting tape, wrap the graft up nice and tight. This will trap in moisture and help prevent the cuts from drying out as the graft union is forming. Lastly, I like to shorten the scion down to a couple of buds. This will give the young tree a better shape. Now you'll know your graft has worked in a couple of weeks time when the scion starts to shoot. When this happens, remove the tape straight away. If you're not feeling terribly confident about your grafting, it can be a good idea to practice on some old sticks first. These can be willow canes, or in this case, old apple prunings. And that leads me on to my next grafting technique I want to show you. 
which is the cleft or V graft. The good thing about this is it's one of the more simple techniques, so it's great for the beginner. It also allows you to graft scion of a small girth onto a large established rootstock. Grab your scion and make two sloping cuts about 2.5 to 3 centimetres long, so it forms a wedge at the base of the scion. And then make two corresponding cuts in the rootstock to form a V. Once that's done, just insert the scion, making sure the cambium layer is aligned on one side. Wrap it in budding tape and wait. The last grafting technique I want to show you is a simple T-bud graft. This is where you can graft multiple varieties onto one established tree. For example, this nectarine onto this peach. All you have to do is find yourself a nice strong bud, bring it over to your tree, find a place on your tree and make a T-cut. and then just peel it open a little bit, exposing that cambium. There we go. Then you just get your bud off your other tree and prepare that. Select your strong bud and then just gouge it out with your knife, making sure to get a lot of cambium. Now that your bud's prepared, just slot it gently into the tea. Then grab your budding tape and just wrap it up making sure not to cover the bud. So there you go. Grafting is easier than you thought it was. Get out there, get experimenting. It's fun and addictive, and it'll open up a whole new world of plant options for you, the home gardener. See you next time. My name's Damon Young. I'm a philosopher and author. I suppose what most interests me is the relationship between ideas and life. I've written on distraction, I've written on exercise, but I've also written on gardens. And I'm really curious about how gardens and gardening can promote reflection, thought, vivid impressions and reverie. When I was writing my first book, I read a lot of uh, biographies and memoirs and letters, and I kept noticing the garden coming up as a theme. This fascinated me, and I wondered, did some of these other authors have the same longing to be in a garden that I did? So I wrote Philosophy in the Garden, which is essentially a, a philosophical companion to the joys and the virtues and the ideas of the garden. Jane Austen found consolation in the garden, the idea of the, the seasons and the cycles. George Orwell, which may surprise some people, um, was a very keen vegetable gardener. Voltaire, um, the French philosopher, was very keen on gardening. He saw gardens not only as an emblem of progress against the world's decay and viciousness, but also as that progress. His idea was that you needed to make France fecund and beautiful. And the garden was one way of doing that. A garden is an invitation to philosophy because it is a unity of humanity and nature. These two enigmas combine in the garden. That's why it's such an inexhaustible um, sort of stock of impressions and concepts and experiences because humanity and nature combine in it and, and they put on a show. A few years ago, my wife was gravely ill and uh, she was hospitalized, she was quarantined, it was, it was awful. And so I was, I was not only um, incredibly stressed but just exhausted all the time. And I remember sitting down and looking out my window uh, and seeing a camellia, the, the first blossom of the season. And for a moment, I was taken outside myself and given a glimpse of a world seemingly more perfect. Um, when I see a camellia in the garden, I'm always reminded of the precariousness of things, um, of the way in which things can fall apart, um, but that doesn't stop you living. 
One of the confronting things about a garden is that its, its beauty, its elegance, its charm will not last forever. Um, there is no eternal garden. There is no perfect paradise. It all falls to pieces and so do we. Um, but I think there's something immensely noble and dignified about making a garden and appreciating a garden. It's like a sacred space. And when you pass over that threshold, it can shift your thinking or at least um, beckon you to think differently. So uh, when I walk into a garden, I'm always slightly prepared to have my mind changed. This is Royal Park on the fringe of the Melbourne CBD. Covering 170 hectares, it's one of the largest urban green spaces in the country, and this is its latest addition. I've given that a pretty good workout. <sighs> this remarkable nature play playground is on the site that once housed the nurses' accommodation and car park at the Royal Children's Hospital here in Parkville. With a new hospital complex to be built on the other side of the park, a deal was struck to return this site to the people and the park. And a great spot to get an overview of the playground, park and new hospital is on top of the grassy mountain which was created using soil dug up when the hospital was built. I must say, it's really impressive this because you've got this great view of the city right out there. It's just, you can always reach out and touch it, can't you? You do, and the, the park essentially was hidden behind the hospital previously and this, this really opened up the corner to address the city and also create a new strong connection to the park. Here on the grassy mountain, I'm catching up with Sky Haldane, the principal architect responsible for the playground's design. And looking down on this, there's a very strong sense that the playground is part of the park. We wanted people to feel that there wasn't really an edge to say, here's where the playground starts and finishes, but that you could actually start to really connect with the open bushland. And we've found that a lot of children have been making um, cubbies in amongst the existing um, Which is... scrub now, because they can see that the landscape is there for them to um, manipulate to and yeah. articulate. So That's marvellous. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a great outcome. And even looking now, you know, it's early in the morning, there's a lot of children already coming into the playground. It's obviously proving enormously yeah. popular with the local people. It is. In, when it first opened, I had a local mother tell us that she was able to get her kids out of bed now with the enticement of a trip to the park before school. <laughs> when we talk about nature play, we mean the use of sand, rock, water and the kinds of elements that you'd find if you went to the beach or to a national park where you're really in a natural environment and that was fundamental the philosophy that we took and only really using structural components where that was the only way that we could achieve it so where you needed children to be able to climb we've used this rocky embankment um, and the topography here to create that sense of challenge there's uneven surfaces for kids they need to think about which journey they're going to take up through it and so it's it's like if you're going to the beach or to the mountains you've got a, a sense of being in a natural setting and a lot of you know, urban children don't have ready access to that, so it was about bringing that opportunity here. As well as connecting children's play to the natural world, the playground's designers were keen to connect the park to the area's history and obtain permission from the local indigenous people, the Wurundjeri, to use representations of their seasons. Their interpretation of the changes in nature didn't have four seasons, it was seven. So that was a key part of them understanding the way that the vegetation, the relationship with animals and their behaviour, food supplies and all those sorts of things were part of that, um, that knowledge of country. Which one of their seasons are we in now? We're in eel season. They would have been harvesting eels as part of a watercourse. We're in a gully landscape and that, that terrain as 
the eels would have moved through would have had eel traps. Um, we've interpreted that in the series of hoops that we have um, oh, so down, those, down through this landscape oh, here. Those hoops over there, they yeah. represent the, the yeah. eel traps. Yeah, so they form a tunnel that graduates down from a, a large scale to a small scale, so the sense of opportunity for a child to experience that um, is, is part of play, but it's also a way of interpreting that story. What are some of the other things you've done to reflect that Aboriginal tradition here? So we have um, water play, which is associated with the, with the dry season. So you have a long, hot summer and then thunderstorms. So that presence of water within the dry is quite a dramatic one. Oh, I can see some drips. So we've incorporated water play both in a constructed way where children can manipulate the water as individuals or as a group. So it's about cooperative play in someone's pumping, someone's directing the water and someone's manipulating it um, in the sand. To properly settle the project within the landscape, a huge number of indigenous plants was used. We've got over 17,500 plants in total, 1,200 of which are trees, so um, it's a substantial amount of vegetation and in the long term the, the tree canopy and, and, and shade will be quite different to what we're sitting in today. So as the sort of principal designer behind this, what does it mean to you? It's been an incredibly rewarding project. Seeing the way that people use it, parents are engaged. I can see an adult walking across the play structure just now. It doesn't seem to be a space that's just for children. People of all ages are using it. It's been a really special and very rewarding project for me. This kind of project doesn't come along very often. While this place is made for fun, there is no doubt that it is also fostering a connection, understanding and empathy with the natural world. And that can only be a good thing for all of us. All garden plants need a bit of maintenance sometime. It might be pruning, fertilising, or treatment for pests and diseases. But some plants need particular care, especially indoor plants, because they're totally reliant on them. Now, every year or two, they'll need their potting mix refreshed. And that's my job for today. And look, you can see why I need to refresh the potting mix. It's collapsed, and that's because the organic matter component has broken down and also compacted, which means there's less volume of soil for water and food for the plant, and also it's not as stable, which is one of the reasons why this thing's beginning to tilt. So what I'll do is pull it out and replace the mix. But first, I'll give it a really good soaking, so hopefully the soil will hold together when we pull it out. That soil's holding together reasonably well. OK. So... The roots here aren't overly root-bound, that's fine. So I'll repot that with fresh mix. The trick here is to get the soil level at just the right height so when the plant goes back in like this, it's sitting at a level about 75 mil from the top of the root ball to the brim of the pot. I'm tucking these roots in gently here. I'm using a good quality potting mix which will hold its structure, allow plenty of air around the roots, drain properly, and it also contains a controlled release fertiliser, which gradually feeds the plant over sort of six to 12 months. There we go. Now this, of course, is a Strelitzia nicolai, and you can see one of the things they do is put off these little pups, these young plants. So when this main mother plant gets too big for inside, I'll just chop it off at the base, and this one, and in due course others, will take its place. Now it's time for a good watering in to stabilise it, as well as flush out any air pockets. And then I'll prune off some of the daggy lower leaves and wash the whole thing down to get rid of the house dust. Now this is still a bit unstable, so I'm going to stake it until the roots re-establish and it's nice and firm, and then the stakes can come out. And last thing, some coarse pine bark mulch to finish it off 
and zhuzh it up. Well, there we go, that's done and looking good. And I'll do exactly the same thing to this ficus a bit later on. But for now, come inside and have a look at this. This one's Monstera deliciosa. It's a rambling plant and in its natural habitat, it's semi-epiphytic and it sort of rambles up trees and gets its moisture and nutrition from decomposing bark and leaf litter and even the air from these aerial roots. All I'm going to do is fill up where it's dropped and these aerial roots will tap into that to pick up its nutrition with the new controlled release fertiliser. And then just a bit of a top dressing with pine bark, a gentle watering in and that's it. This little dwarf spathophyllum in the kids' bathroom is doing beautifully, in fact, so much so, I don't think it even needs a repot. What I will do is just prune off some of these spent flowers, give it a light feed using controlled release fertiliser, just a pinch every six months. And if you overfeed it, you can burn the plant, waste the fertiliser, and have it grow too fast for it indoors. Look, don't panic. It's not merely above all scale. It's kids' toothbrush splatter and very importantly getting all the dust off it at the same time so the leaves are nice and clean and the plant does much better that way. So refresh your potting mix on your indoor plants when they need it, especially the big ones. Give all of them a little TLC and your indoor garden will thrive. Conjure up a vision of an apartment rooftop in St Kilda and you might wonder why I'm here. But the rooftop I'm on isn't quite like the others around it. Sonia, you're one of the residents of the building. What have you created here? Well, we've created a meadow in the sky with 3,500 plants and um, an area of about 650 square metres. We've got three deck areas. We've created a closer community, a place for children just to run, run free and have a connection to nature. What sort of plants and planting details have you put out? We have a lot of native grasses. We have some climbing plants, ground covers, and we have our vegetable boxes. I like that the, the path's got... A bit of an angle to it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's lovely. We planted the rosemary here to be next to the veggie boxes so that the bees are drawn to the rosemary and they come and help the vegetables to grow as well and create a little bee community. And I noticed that your combination of plants here are already starting to complement each other. Yes. So we've got the lovely bulbine lily, and we have our purple cutleaf daisy. And the dianellas. Yep. There's lots of colour and lots of flower yep. across multiple months. Yeah. Mark, you're also a resident here. What's been your involvement in this project? Oh, well, the guys engaged me basically because I work in the industry and um, they wanted someone to um, build the decks and do some carpentry work and also make sure that everything gets built to code. There was a um, number of things we needed to achieve to make sure that it would get a building permit passed in the end. There was a lot of challenges. The membrane was the most time-consuming part of the project. Um, it took just over three months for the guys to roll out all the membrane. They have to hand heat seal every join um, that then gets tested and retested to make sure it's absolutely perfect and, and leak-proof before we could even consider putting the garden down. In order to meet the engineer's specifications, we were only able to use 120 mil of garden. So it's made up of a membrane, followed by a drainage cell, a layer of fabric to stop the soil seeking into the drainage, and then the soil itself. Now we're nine months on, and this is the growth we've got. 
What are the costs behind establishing a garden on a roof like this? We were lucky enough to get a grant for our roof, but if we had to pay for it, each apartment would have had to contribute $10,000. Our apartments now are, have increased in value by 60000 So the benefit, the economic benefit, has been well worth it. In terms of environmental benefits, it collects and cleans the stormwater and provides a huge amount of biodiversity. It also delays the effect of flash flooding after events and it absorbs heat and so it reduces the air temperatures above our apartment. If every building in the inner city had a green roof, it would drop the temperature of the city. What about social benefits? Huge. We, we did this uh, for the environmental benefits and we never imagined how incredible the social benefits were. It just has created so much happiness for everybody. It's given people an outdoor space that we never had and a communal space. Yeah, that's right. You just walk out our back stairs, come up here and you automatically relax. I knew it would be amazing, but I didn't think it would be this amazing. It's changed my whole outlook. We wouldn't move now to get a backyard. We love where we live and we'll stay here now because we've got this. <laughs> What a wonderful space to come home to. A place to bring people together and for families to grow. It's amazing what you can do with a garden and what a garden can do for you. Here's what's coming up on next week's show. I'm near the Grampians in Victoria, where the fresh produce grown here travels just a short distance before it's used in an award-winning restaurant. I want to show you one way to propagate elephant foot yam. Look at this, it's covered. All these little swellings here, each one can be cut off to become a 